everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gitty Mary and I do analysis impact videos on different types of internet phenomena, materials and products. And we talk about the impact on the environment, on people, etc. And one of the more requested videos in this series has been about bees and honey. And I've been putting this off for a really long time because frankly I had to do a lot of digging to give you guys a comprehensive overview of what to think about when we buy honey. And I finally have it ready for you guys. I'm so ready to dig in. Bees have played an important role in human's understanding of nature for literally centuries. The existence and the retelling and the cultivation of honeybees and honey has been a vital part of humans understanding of nature. It's been a part of our mythology and our culture and our cuisines for literally as long as humans have existed. It's a central part in many traditions, crafts, and it's a very vital part of nature and ecosystems. As such, there's a really good reason to care about this. Even if you don't like honey, if you don't eat it, and if you don't really particularly care about bees, I would listen up anyway. Because you might have heard that bees are having kind of a tough time right now. First of all, some cool facts about bees. There are over 20,000 different species of bees, but the ones that we conventionally know are probably one of eight honeybees. Queen bees have an average lifespan of probably one to two years. Some species are documented to live up to five years. And the worker bee has an average lifespan of 15 to 38 days during the summer and 150 to 200 days in the winter. And during the course of a lifetime, a worker bee will be able to create about 1 12th of a teaspoon of honey. It takes so much work. Such a tiny amount is produced. And these worker bees fly an average of 55,000 miles to produce one pound of honey and visit over 2 million flowers. So it's kind of fair to respect the labor of the bees. Okay, there are badasses moving on. By the way, while I was making the script for this video, I could not resist adding in puns, so I'm so sorry. This chapter is called How is that our beesness? Okay. Now, the main reason why we're interested in honeybees is because they produce honey from nectar. Nectar contains sugars and vitamins, salts and other nutrients that are kind of vital for the bee's health that the bee needs to survive. Nectar is also the bee's main energy source that they require, but they also need pollen because pollen contains proteins and fats. I've seen a common misperception around that honey is made from pollen, but it's made from nectar, but there is traces of pollen in the honey. And when bees and other pollinators visit one flower or plant, they take the pollen from that plant and then transfer it to another plant and that's pollination and that's fertilization. And that's pretty vital because that's how we get fruit, nuts and a bunch of other vegetables that we require in our food systems. Pollinators like bees contribute directly to food security. According to the bee experts at the Food and Agriculture Organization at the United Nations, one third of the world's fruit production depends on bees. Bees and other pollinators such as birds and bats affect 35% of the world's crop production, increasing outputs of 87 of the leading world crops worldwide and many plant-derived medicines. So overall, pretty, pretty important. Yeah, pretty important. Around 70 of the vital crops in the UK are dependent on pollination. And this is something we see everywhere in the world. It's pretty safe to say that we depend heavily on pollination. If we didn't have pollinators, imagine going into a supermarket and seeing every other shelf empty. Bees and other pollinators are declining in abundance in many parts of the world largely due to intensive farming practices, monocropping, excessive use of agricultural chemicals, and higher temperatures associated with climate change, affecting not only crop yields, but also nutrition. If this development continues, nutritious crops like fruits and nuts and many vegetables will have to be substituted increasingly by stable crops like rice or corn or potatoes, eventually resulting in an unbalanced diet for people. So it's in everyone's best interest to keep the numbers of pollinators in the world. Up. Imagine a world where you have to rely on french fries for survival and you can't even fry them because ha, seed oils require pollinators, aha! So how do bees actually make honey? Honey is not a byproduct of anything, pun intended. Honey is this incredibly energy rich food that bees use in times where they cannot get to flowers, for instance during the winter or doing specific types of weather 
where they can't fly. Honey is a pretty vital part of bees' survival. Bees also need energy to regulate the temperature inside the hive, which they do by beating their wings to generate heat. Fun fact about bees, they beat their wings an average of 12,000 times per minute. And the heat that's generated through the beating of the wings is also one part of the honey production. It's the heat that helps the water, moisture and the sugars evaporate, which makes the honey. So, but there are more aspects to it, one sec. Basically, honey is made by reducing the moisture content in nectar, and for the most part, that's done after the bees return to the hive. The nectar is stored in the bees' nectar stomachs, where the bees eventually pump the nectar out of their stomachs into storage. It's, however, not the same as vomit or spit. Personally, I don't really think it makes sense to compare the biological functions of an insect and mammals. It's very different functions, and they serve vastly different purposes, so I think when people compare honey to spit or vomit, I think it's mostly to make honey feel or seem more unappealing, but it's not technically correct. Again, I don't really think it makes sense to compare functions of two vastly different animals. I'm not gonna do that. But it goes from their stomach out of their mouths and then they often trade it around and the, the moisture evaporates and that's how honey is produced. The nectar gets broken down into simple sugars and because of the bee's constant wing batting, it evaporates, leaving behind a thickened substance that we know as honey, which once again, the bees need to survive. The million dollar question though is, can honey be made sustainably or ethically? Now, there are a few different things to consider here, but first of all, I think it's important to note that honey made from hobby scale farmers and industrially commercial grade honey are two very different things and thus come with two very different environmental impacts. There's also the fact that a lot of the honey you buy in bigger supermarkets or from bigger companies and the honey that's used in ingredients, in sweets and cakes and every type of product is often diluted and not 100% pure honey. The honey is diluted because it's pretty difficult to upscale honey production because bees work as fast with the flowers they have available and there's not really any way to intensify the honey production when bees are working in the pace that they're working. So the honey is diluted to make it stretch further. And actually there is an episode of Netflix Rotten about this that's really interesting that I recommend you check out. Beekeepers of course point towards beekeeping as something that's been practiced for centuries and note that the proper farmers always leave enough honey for the bees to eat. It makes sense that beekeepers are interested in the survival of the bees but at the same time it's also common practice especially for more industrial commercial grade honey to take all the honey to sell and replace it with a cheaper sugar alternative, which doesn't contain the same amount of nutrients and benefits as their honey. But there is an argument to be made that honey from small beekeepers who leave honey for their bees to eat is more sustainable, at least when looking at the impact on ecosystems and the health of the bees. But there's also the ethical argument regarding necessity. Now, honey is essential for bee survival and it isn't for humans. Now, I don't eat honey myself. It's an animal product and as such I don't eat it. But many people do and there's really no point in trying to argue against the benefits in the nutrients and that type of sugar present within honey. However, it's not necessary for people as it is for bees. But I think it's a bit of a tired argument because we have talked on this channel about the argument regarding necessity. There's loads of things that aren't necessary for human survival that we do anyway, like clip-on earrings, but they're still pretty neat to have. So I won't dwell too much on the necessity argument, especially not when there are more important things to consider. For instance, it's basically impossible to create industrial scale honey without harming the bees because it's impossible to meet industry demand without harming the animals that's used within the industry. That's true in any industry. Bees are either harmed with smoke, pesticides, or the cheap sugar alternatives that's used instead of honey. And in the big scale industry, many bees are often killed off and replaced by new bees rather than maintaining a healthy hive. And when it comes to ethics, I think it also makes sense to point out that the queen's wings are snapped off so she doesn't fly off. Those are the main ethical components that I have come across at least. You might have heard that bees and other pollinators such as butterflies, bats and hummingbirds are increasingly under threat because of pollution from human activities. Bee populations have declined globally during the last decades, primarily due to habitat loss, intensive farming practices, changes in weather patterns and excessive use of agrochemicals 
like pesticides. One in six bee species is regionally extinct and more than 40% are vulnerable to extinction, which is a cause for concern considering how much our global food systems depend on pollination from bees. Air pollution is also thought to affect bee populations because research find that air pollutants interact with the scent molecules released by plants which bees use to locate their food. This makes the bees unable to forage and pollinate effectively. Many bees have to travel more than 3,000 feet from their hive to find a food source, depending only on the scent traces in the air. And when that sense is disrupted, it makes it hard for the bees to find the plants and also hard for the bees to find their hive. In the US, there is around 4,000 different native types of bees. Most of them are solitary bees, which means that they don't live in hives, they live in nests or cavities in the ground. And at least 23% of native bees in the US have declined, especially in areas affected by commodity crop production. Other threats to native bees include climate-driven landscape changes like rising sea levels. We also have increased temperatures, loss of host plants, but, and this is where it gets interesting, they are also threatened by competition and disease from non-native honeybees. So as we established in the beginning of the video, there are more than 20,000 different species of bees, but eight honeybees. What often happens is that the extensive use of the honeybee take over natural habitat that would otherwise have been inhabited by native bees. So multiple species are replaced by one. And if you think this is starting to sound a little bit like a monoculture, you would be right. This makes an ecosystem incredibly vulnerable and it's basically as problematic as replacing a forest with a crop field or plant a lawn. It creates a weaker and less functioning ecosystem. And bees, any kind of bee, have a really good rep when it comes to good vibes. We are using bees in advertising a whole lot because consumers often don't distinguish between which kind of bee we're talking about. And saying that we need to save the bees and looking at honeybees sort of feels the same as saying we need to save the birds and looking at chickens in animal agriculture. It's kind of not the same thing. And we're out here shooting ourselves in the foot because we are weakening a system that we deeply depend on for food security. And our solution is creating a weaker and weaker ecosystem that we still depend on and that we depend on increasingly. Our food system is kind of playing itself and it sort of feels like that meme where the guy puts a stick into the wheel of his bike. So when we say the bees are dying, we are not talking about honeybees. The population of honeybees has actually grown exponentially since the 60s with around 83%. But honeybees aren't necessarily the best pollinators. They're what we call general pollinators, which means that they can pollinate most plants, but not as effectively as specialized pollinators. For instance, it can require thousands and thousands of honeybees to pollinate an apple field, while it might only take a few hundred of a specialized bee to do the same job. That's why biodiversity is so important and why we can't just replace native pollinators with honeybees. It doesn't really work like that. At least it creates a weaker food system for us and a weaker ecosystem for our environment. And that's because honeybees aren't a native wild species. And that's why it's so important to have biodiversity with native species of birds, pollinators and insects, because they're specialized in the different types of plants and flowers and trees that's also native to that given area. They become specialized over generations and generations through evolution and adaptation. And that's really important. That's really, really, really important. Native pollinators have adapted to different types of growing and blooming patterns of native plants and flowers that non-native honeybees simply have not. So we're bringing in outside guys to do a worse job. But why are we bringing in outside guys in the first place? The outside guys being the honeybees. Well, that's because we don't actually have that many native pollinators anymore. Because the number of native pollinators like wild bees are declining, we're starting to bring in honeybees to do the pollination instead. We are moving honeybees around to different fields to pollinate our crops and that's terrible for our environment and that's terrible for the bees. And it's in every sense of the word a half-assed solution. It's terrible for the bees because they are going to be exposed to vast amounts of agrochemicals like pesticides. And it's also terrible for the wild bees, the sparse amount that are left, because the honeybees take up that habitat and they eat their food and they also leave behind parasites and disease that the wild bees cannot fight off 
so they die. And then, alas, we are trapped in a loop of depending on honeybees and moving them around while gradually increasing the issue, intensifying the issue further and further and further. Such a bad solution. <laughs> Basically, we've continuously decreased the population of animals that we increasingly depend on. When we say save the bees, we're not talking about honeybees, because it's not the most effective pollinator to save. Also, it's doing fine. Instead, we should be focusing on all the other type of bees. As such, having a beehive in your backyard might not be as effective in terms of saving the bees as we might have hoped or thought. But what's being done about it? I am literally so sorry. In May 2018, the European Union upheld a partial ban on three insecticides known as neonicotinoids to mitigate the lethal threat they pose to bees. Ideally, we should also look at how we grow food in the first place. The number one threat to bees are harsh chemicals used in agriculture and monocrops, which destroy habitat for pollinators as well as countless other animals. Of course, there are a few things that you can do as well to help save the bees the actual bees. You can plant nectar-bearing flowers such as marigolds or sunflowers for decorative purposes on your balcony, terrace or in your garden. If you're eating honey, avoid it in processed foods and buy solely from small local beekeepers. You can also set up a pollinator farm or an insect hotel on your balcony, on your terrace on your garden. It's important to preserve old meadows because they feature a more diverse array of flowers and nectar-bearing plants. And if we're cutting down grass or meadows, wait until the flowers have finished blooming. Also avoid using pesticides in your garden altogether. And buy organic produce where there hasn't been used agrochemicals to produce them. Also eating seasonal and local produce will make a huge difference. Supporting more seasonal small-scale farmers means less monocrops or being less dependent on monocrops. And that's really the only way to really save the bees. I would love to hear if any of you guys are doing something in your everyday life to save the bees or help biodiversity. Let me know, that's super, super inspiring. So comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!